Welcome to It's Our Money with Ellen Brown, a look behind the curtain of global finance and monetary control with one of the foremost experts in the field. Author of the bestseller Web of Debt and the Public Bank Solution, Ellen Brown's groundbreaking work began the movement to create new American public banks. We'll look at issues surrounding the world of money and the systems and powers that control it, as well as the progress being made on the public banking frontier. The program is underwritten by Public Banking Associates, a national consultancy of experts advising government leaders pursuing creation of their own public banks at publicbankingassociates.com. So I think what it takes now somehow to convince people that we're in a situation that's really similar to that that we were in in 1940. Because in 1940, we weren't at war, but war was kind of imminent. And there was a war out in the outer world going on. And people could kind of see the writing on the wall. And I guess what we have to do is get people to see the writing on the wall again now, because we're kind of at war with climate change too, aren't we? And it seems to me that all of what we're faced with right now is just as, as existentially threatening uh, as were the Nazis and the Japanese Empire uh, in the late 30s and early 40s of, of the last century. Now, that's an interesting historical perspective you probably didn't think was about inflation, that investing in preparation for some cataclysm could lift off the concerns of monetary inflation simply by employing the energy of productivity. Hello, I'm Walt McCree, and this is It's Our Money with Ellen Brown. I'm Ellen's co-host and colleague at the Public Banking Institute. And on today's program, we're going to once again take the privilege of visiting with a nationally prominent intellectual who's dealing with monetary insights and monetary systems and the history of the Fed, Dr. Robert Hockett. Both Bob and Ellen have written recently about inflation and other monetary matters, but inflation seems to be most prominent on people's minds these days. It is a commonly misunderstood concern that gets boiled down to two basic notions. One, that there's too much money in circulation, or the other, that the demand side is pushing prices up. Neither one necessarily pertains or is completely correct, and it seems at times that the Federal Reserve itself is ill-equipped to really do much about it, except in the most general of ways. In his recent article in Forbes, Bob suggests that the Fed could be far more effective if it would return to its earlier days of regional monetary involvement through its 12 regional banks, what he likes to call spread the Fed. This, in contrast to the other view held by some, that we should end the Fed. Bob's knowledge on this subject is comprehensive and fascinating to listen to. We hope you'll enjoy this conversation. It's my great pleasure to be speaking once again to Professor Robert Hockett who teaches law at Cornell Law School, has clerked for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit, and has consulted for the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, the International Monetary Fund, and a number of federal and state legislators. We're also very pleased <laughs> to have him consulting for us on, as a member of our Public Banking Institute Advisory Board. So, Bob, it's great to be speaking to you again in this new <laughs> 2022 year. Um, so you've written, you write a regular column for Forbes magazine, and you've written a number of interesting articles in 2021, so I wanted to go over a few of those. Oh. So the one that interested me the most was, uh, well, let me say first, you wrote a three-part uh, series on inflation and how right now I think that's probably the burning issue in the economy is that the Fed is talking about tightening, which means raising interest rates cutting off quantitative easing or cutting off their bonds, yeah, et cetera, and which you think, and I also think is the wrong approach. I mean, it's we don't have too much money in the, in the real economy. Maybe we have too much money floating around in the stock market, but that's a different issue. So uh, the, what we really have is not too much money, but too few goods or 
you know, we've got all these, you know, supply chain crises and so forth. So you've written about that and I did too, that the way to fix that is <laughs> to get some money into the local economy for productivity. And so what really interested me was your series on the once and future Fed and Treasury about how the Federal Reserve could actually do that without even going to Congress. I mean, we don't even need to change the law because it's already in the law. It's what they used to do. It was the way the Fed was set up originally. And so a lot of people are very suspicious of the Fed. They want to end the Fed, but you say, no, we need to spread the Fed, which is what it was set up to do, but it's not doing. So anyway, would you, would you, would you like to explain all that? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, I mean, what what you haven't forgotten, of course, because you're an historian and an, uh, an authority on the matter yourself, but what the, the broader public seems indeed to have forgotten is that the Federal, Federal Reserve System was set up in the first instance to function like something akin uh, to a network of regional development banks. Um, not in the sense of you know, the World Bank or whatever going out and making all sorts of direct investments uh, in particular projects and the like, but in a somewhat different sense that was familiar to late 19th century Europeans, especially late 19th century Germans like Paul Warburg, for example, who was of course one of the founders of the Federal Reserve System once he immigrated to the US. And that was that you would have regional banks that were attuned to regional economic conditions. And what they would do would be in effect to help to make credit much cheaper on a region by region basis by or through a willingness to purchase short-term financing instruments from local banks, which in turn had made the loans in the first place to local businesses. And the focus was to be then on the real economy, not the financial economy, and to make sure that real growth, real investment in new startup industries, in new technologies, in new sort of small businesses or family owned businesses or the like, that capital for that would be in bountiful supply but that capital would not be in bountiful supply for speculative purposes. And so that's why we have, of course, re the regional Federal Reserve district banks on the one hand, which are then sort of overseen by a federal scoped uh, Federal Reserve Board on the other hand. Um, so that system worked quite well uh, during the first 20 years of the Fed's existence but what went wrong, of course, was that, you know, during after the great crash of 1929, the Federal Reserve System continued to operate in a manner that sort of pretended that all monetary problems were endogenously generated, never exogenously generated. And so it did not respond. <laughs> I have to stop you because I, I think most people, you know, we're, we're trying to talk to to non-economists, so can you right. explain what you mean by that? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so let's first, just as a quick kind of background point uh, for your listeners, um, sort of reprise a point that you yourself have made so eloquently in so many of your books. And that is that in part, the, mo the money supply is what we call endogenous, which is to say that it's generated by banks themselves who extend credit to various borrowers who have various productive projects in mind, right? So if I've got an idea for a new product or a new business, it's relatively local, let's say, let's say I'm in Kansas City or maybe I'm in central Kansas or whatever. Uh, and I have a good a, a project in mind that looks like a very good prospect. It's clear to uh, bankers that I've thought it through and it looks likely to pan out. I'll go to a bank asking for basically startup capital to sort of get that new project underway. And the bank will extend the credit to me by crediting an account in my name out of which I can then spend. And in so doing, of course, the bank has quote unquote created money. It's generated what the great Swedish economist Knut Vixel uh, dubbed credit, I'm mean, sorry, dubbed bank money. Um, but what people like you and I, a hundred years later in a world of shadow banking, that in addition to regular banking, would call credit money. Now that is endogenous according to the economists in the sense that it is generated by the economy itself. It's generated by 
entities that have business projects in mind that banks critique and find plausible and likely to pan out. And they accordingly extend monetized credit in order to finance a project like that. Now, if all money were of that form, if that was the only form that money ever took, then it would be the case that things like crashes can't happen, the bubbles can't happen, as long as the banks were only extending that credit for productive projects, not merely speculative ones. And the Fed in the first 20 years of its existence seems to have been largely run by people who held that belief. They understood that most money is endogenous, like you and I understand, the mistake that they made, however, is to have thought that all money was endogenous. But in fact, there was an exogenous boost to the money supply as well, meaning a boost from the outside of the U.S. economy that flooded into the American economy in the 1920s. And that was essentially a huge influx of money from Europe in particular and from investors worldwide who saw the booming American economy in the 1920s and shot all sorts of money into the system in order to sort of take part in the speculative boom that got underway on Wall Street in particular during the so-called Roaring Twenties. And so we had a sudden exogenous influx of money into the money supply. The Fed didn't think that that could possibly be a bubble because it believed all money at the time was endogenous. And uh, accordingly, any additional money that was being generated was being generated for productive purposes. And that was the mistake that it made. It made then the same mistake in reverse after the crash, because what many people were arguing is that the Fed basically has to deal with the sudden shrinkage of the money supply that was the consequence of the crash and that the Fed had to inject more money into the system. But the Fed didn't think that was necessary because it thought again, that basically insofar as there are real business needs for money, it's always going to be forthcoming. That was a mistake. And so what happened was that Congress stepped in in 1935. It passed the National Banking Act of 1935. And as you know, that sort of changed the arrangement at the Fed. Um, and it, it, it sort of resulted in a much more New York-centered Fed that was basically enthralled to Irving Fisher's understanding of how the money supply was determined. And so the Fed began to sort of de-emphasize the role of the regional Federal Reserve Bank banks and became a much more New York focused institution. That was also, of course, the birth of the Federal Open Market Committee as a sort of permanent institutional part of the Fed. And as you know, the FOMC focuses primarily on the aggregate quantity of money in the economy, not on the allocation of that aggregate, which is what the regional Federal Reserve Banks had previously done. So what I've been pushing uh, along very Ellen Brown style lines is a kind of par partial return, right, to the pre-crash Fed. And that's a Fed that recognizes that, yes, you do need an FOMC to modulate credit aggregates economy-wide, but you also need the regional Federal Reserve Banks to be focusing, as they used to do, on regional economic conditions and discounting, basically buying short-term credit instruments from banks that have extended credit to local businesses, small businesses, startup firms, and the like, um, in order to keep the Fed a primarily production-focused institution rather than a speculation-focused institution, which it's, of course, become. That's the, that's the idea in a nutshell. So what stops them from doing that now? I mean, why doesn't the San Francisco Fed or any local Fed pump credit into its local mm -hmm. region? There's no, legal, um, there's no legal impediment, whatever. All there is is an intellectual impediment. In essence, Fed folk and central bankers more broadly are still in thrall to an understanding of credit money that really came to the fore in the 1930s, which is that basically 
all you can do is look at the aggregates and not try to bother, you know, not bother with allocation, not pick winners and losers, as they say, um, and basically just, you know, um, um, make sure to fight inflation and everything else will sort of take care of itself. Uh, that is a mistake. Uh, and that has become a kind of dominant, I guess you could say dogma, uh, and has been one over the last 80 to 90 years. Whereas the Fed before the 1930s was enthralled to the opposite dogma, which was also a problem. And that was, again, the belief that, well, as long as, you know, you basically have a system whereby money is only generated in order to finance productive projects. You never have to worry about credit aggregates. Another way to put this is to say that the Fed now tends to look at all money as though it were exogenously supplied. The Fed in the previous uh, era tended to look at all money as though it were endogenously generated. Both were mistaken because there are both kinds of money, right? There are exogenous monetary shocks that do indeed occur. And you need a primarily modulation focused Fed to deal with those exogenous changes. But it's also the case that a great deal of the money supply, and indeed probably by far the greater part of it, is endogenously generated. And if you focus then on making sure that that endogenously generated money is going only to finance productive projects, not speculative projects, then you will have done your job. I call this a two a two bladed scissors fed, right? You need one blade of the scissors to deal with exogenous money. You need another blade of the scissors to deal with endogenous money. The problem before 1929 was it was a one bladed scissors. The problem since 1929 is it's again a one bladed yeah, scissors, it's just the other blade. But you need them both in order to get the job done. And that's where I think you and I come into this story, because you and I and some others, of course, some of our colleagues have been pushing for some time, nobody as long as you, but some for a while um, on a, a sort of proper understanding of where money comes from, what the sources of the money supply are and what the policy implications of that sort of dual nature of money are. Um. That one of the local Fed, regional Federal Reserves wanted to do that, they could, and oh, they yeah. just don't because, I mean, they don't have to ask anybody's permission. They don't have to go to Washington and say, we'd like to, you know, buy some lithium <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> you know, one of yeah, so they have the statutory authority, um, as you know. There could be an internal institutional difficulty in as much as the sort of practice that has developed over the decades is for the regional feds to defer to the Federal Open Market Committee on the one hand, and then for the Federal Open Market Committee in turn to defer very largely to the Fed chair on the one hand and the president of the New York Fed on the other hand. As you know, those two persons are sort of first among equals or among theoretical equals on the FOMC. Uh, and so you would need um, regional Fed presidents with, or maybe even regional Fed staffs with a little bit more self-confidence than is the norm right now. First of all, to sort of push back against any pressure that was applied um, against doing more regional lending. Um, and you might also want more confident and uh, uh, sort of uh, knowledgeable regional Fed officials to sort of continue lobbying the Federal Reserve Board on the one hand and the FOMC on the other, to sort of go back to a way of thinking that is not entirely that of the pre-1930s Fed, but is partly that. But, you know, that's a matter of, again, getting people uh, in charge of the regional feds who are right-minded. It would also be great if we could get people on the board who are right-minded. Another way to think about this, Ellen, to go back to this terminology that I was using before, as you know, for quite some time, I've been at pains to sort of distinguish these two primary functions of a central bank that I've noted before, one is the one I call the modulation function, and that's the function of making sure that national credit aggregates in, in total or in some are correct. 
the more informal term would just be the money supply. Yeah. Right, the, the sort of the the sum total of money. So, if you think about the the modulatory role as essentially the job of keeping the money supply right on the one hand, and then think of the allocation role as basically directing or sort of channeling the money to productive uses rather than merely speculative uses. My view is that you need both of those functions to be discharged by a central bank. Now, the mistake that was made by the Fed before the 1930s was the thought that the belief that taking care of allocate, if you take care of allocation, modulation will take care of itself. Right. And the mistake that's been made by the Fed since the 1930s is to think that if you take care of the modulation problem, the allocation problem will take care of itself. Mm -hmm. It turns out that both of those are mistaken views. You actually have to do both. That in turn is because again, there is endogenously generated money on the one hand, but there's also exogenously inflowing money at times or exogenously outflowing money at other times on the other hand. And so again, you need a pair of scissors with both blades. You of course have probably heard of the doctrine that is sometimes named as the, the sort of early Fed doctrine. That was the so-called real bills doctrine, right? And there's this sort of orthodoxy now to the effect that the real bills doctrine was just completely wrong. And then anytime you talk about allocation, they'll say, well, that's just the real bills doctrine. And that's proved to have been false because of what the, the mistakes that the Fed made right after the 1929 crash. My contention is that the real bills doctrine was exactly half right and half wrong. Um, and that's just another way of saying that um, what I said earlier, which is that the Fed before the 1930s was correct about allocation being a critical task, but was incorrect in thinking that that was the only task. And what we did is we threw the baby, the proverbial baby out with the bathwater. We said, oh, okay, well, so allocation's not enough. Therefore, let's only do modulation. But that's equally mistaken, in my view. Mm -hmm. You might you might have to <laughs> define real bills too. That's what I'm thinking is that we can issue all the credit we want as against invoices, which were what the real bills were. Like it, you're you're not just. In fact, you did an article called "What Backs the Dollar: Easy Production." So it's not just. Yes. It's not just the goods that are already out there. It's the right. goods that you will be produced with the money, which is the real bills doctrine. Basically, yes. like you've got the invoices, you've got somebody who wants this stuff that's willing to yeah. pay for it. You just don't have the product yet. And that exactly. is the yeah, okay. Exactly. So another way to think of this, Ellen, that I think might be intuitively helpful for those who are not experts is if you think of goods and services as absorbing money, in other words, the money that is spent on them is sort of taken out of, you know, it is basically sort of taken out of circulation, or it's at least not being used speculatively if it's being used to purchase real goods and services. And if you think of the of monetary balance as the balance between the quantity of money on the one hand and the quantity of goods and services on the other, then what we can say is if you generate new money without generating new goods and services, then you are acting in a manner that's likely to exert uh, inflationary pressures. If, on the other hand, the new money is financing the production of goods and services that will absorb that new money itself, then, of course, you're maintaining that same balance between money supplies on the one hand and goods and services supplies on the other. And so you're not generating inflation. And that's all the real bills doctrine was about, is it was saying, look, if the new money is associated with real bills, i.e. with real productive activity, it's not going to be inflationary, right? Um, and that was true. That was largely true as far as that, that particular new money was concerned. What it overlooked, of course, is the possibility of, again, exogenously sourced money, basically inflows from outside of the American monetary system, which of course happened in a big way in the 1920s. And that was the source of the bubble, or at least it was part of the source of the bubble. And of course, that's what resulted in a crash. And then the Fed, because it was focused solely on the real bills doctrine, as then understood, did not see a role for itself to sort of basically 
add, inject new money into the system after that sudden outflux of money from the system that happened when the crash occurred. So um, again, then, if we sort of think of the, the, the sort of the Fed before 29 as having been half right, and then the, fo- the Fed post-1935 is being half right also, but on the other side of the equation, so to speak, we could say, well, put them both together and you got it right, right? I would think it's not just exogenous money as in coming from Europe or whatever, but, but when the Fed uh, generates money that, or you know, it generates reserves, which go to the banks, which then um, back loans that aren't productive, the loans yes. to like for housing that's not new housing, but existing housing, that's going to create a bubble. Yes. So you, what you need is somewhere that some portion of the, the Federal Reserve needs or the Treasury is, which is what happens now, but they're not two, two halves of the scissors. I mean, they're not that coordinated. So it's a great idea to have the regional feds actually determining productivity and putting money in where, where it's needed. Yes. Um, yeah. And you gave a great example of uh, World War II, where we knew we were at war. I think that's the difference. Like if you convince yeah. people that you're about to be run over by the Japanese or the Nazis or something, you know, and that, that there's a real threat to survival, then yeah. everybody says fine. And, you know, they let the, the president says we're going to do this and they did it. But yeah. but they just pumped out credit like crazy. Yeah. And so do you want to go into that story and why yeah. is not why is that not working today? I mean, we're in a sort of war. Many people feel like we're at war, but but we we're not mobilized like we were then. Yeah. No, great, great, great question, um, Ellen. So what, yeah, what, what happened, um, and this was even before the attack on Pearl Harbor, the real wake-up call uh, for FDR and for the American administration, and maybe even just the public more broadly, uh, came in the late spring, uh, early summer of 1940. Um, and that was when the Germans overran France in a mere six weeks. Everybody had expected that once Hitler turned on France, you would get the kind of a replay of the First World War. So they thought everything will bog down in trench warfare. There's going to be, you know, long trenches in which both sides are sort of stuck and there won't be any movement anymore. It'll just be a long, slow bleed of Europe yet again. Um, And so everybody was apparently quite stunned when the Nazis, you know, uh, acting on this new doctrine of Blitzkrieg or lightning war with all sorts of tanks, just ran right over France within a mere six weeks. And they thought, holy crap, we might be in trouble here. And so Roosevelt went to Congress the day after France capitulated uh, and said, look, we have to become an arsenal of democracy here in the U.S. or else we're going to be drawn into the war. He apparently still was hoping we might be able to stay out. But he thought the U.K., which is the only country now still fighting the Nazis, isn't able to produce all that it needs. And so he turns to the American aircraft industry, which had produced 3,500 planes that year and had produced even fewer the year before, and said, I need 50,000 bombers <laughs> by the end of the year. And people thought he was insane. What, you're saying an industry that produced 3,500? <laughs> and in fact, they ended up producing 60,000 that year. But how they did it is the, is the real interesting thing that we'll come to in a second. But he also said, look, we need lots of tanks. We need uniforms. We need boots. We need fuel. We need rubber. Because, of course, um, you know, basically most of the rubber supply was coming from Southeast Asia and the Japanese were quite inconveniently overrunning Southeast Asia, taking the Dutch colonies and the French and British colonies there. And so we needed to be able to create a whole new industry, a synthetic rubber industry. We had to do all this stuff um, and we had to do it fast. So what did they do? Well, there were sort of two things, right? First of all, we actually created some public corporations, some actual government corporations to do the building of the new factories in which all of these new products would be produced. It was called the Defense Plant Corporation. 
And we also provided all of the financing that was necessary to enable private sector firms to start using these new factories that we publicly built and start producing massively. And we did even more than that. We had a defense, we created a defense homes corporation, which built entire neighborhoods for the workers in these new factories to live in. We also built schools and daycare centers for the workers in all of these new places to send their kids to during the day. We actually, we built all sorts of health clinics so that they, they could get medical care in all of these places. And all of this was planned out and, and acted upon and executed by a sort of massive public-private partnership. You had all these industrial leaders who regularly met in Washington with the White House cabinet, with um, all sorts of other federal officials, and they figured out, well, what do we need? You know, what do we need to make this country into the most massively productive society in all of human history? And it was essentially done this way. When the feds built the factories, moreover, that they, they leased them uh, to the private sector companies like General Motors and um, uh, Chrysler Corporation and Kaiser uh, Corporation and others, leased them cheaply to those producers. Um, and then, at the, of course, at the end of the war, they sold them cheaply to the same companies. And then that ended up being the basis for the enormous consumer goods productivity of the US economy after the war, where you know, we basically accounted for close to 60% of gross world product for the 30 years following the Second World War. So I think what it takes now, Ellen, is just what you suggested before, somehow to convince people that we're in a situation that's really similar to that that we were in in 1940. Because in 1940, we weren't at war, but war was kind of imminent. And there was a war out in the outer world going on. And people could kind of see the writing on the wall. And I guess what we have to do is get people to see the writing on the wall again now. It's partly a matter of competition from global rivals like China. But you know, far more important than that, I think, is we're kind of at war with climate change too, aren't we? I mean, the planet is imperiled at this point. Um, and it seems to me that all of what we're faced with right now is just as, as existentially threatening uh, as were the Nazis and the Japanese empire uh, in the late 30s and early 40s of, of the last century. I'm still stuck on this regional Fed thing. Right now, they, you, you can go to the, the discount window, right? Which is basically discounting your commercial paper or your your invoices like you're yeah, going to get paid bills. in three months so yeah. so the, the fed or whoever is discounting your your paper will give you something less than what you're going to collect on your invoices because you might not collect it it's risky you know they're taking yeah. a risk and therefore it's discounted so that's why it's yeah. called the discount window i know yeah. that you know any bank in good standing now can go to the fed's <laughs> discount window but it's for three months. I mean, you couldn't really build a, a battery factory or whatever yeah. in three months, I don't think, and, and get your money back. So yeah. how would you do it, you know, operationally, practically? How, how would we pull this off? Yeah, I think there are two, probably two things that it would be good to, to do, Ellen. Um, my own view for what it's worth is that for sort of big construction projects, like let's say uh, semiconductor factories, which cost around 15 to $17 billion to build, it might be better to do sort of direct federal investment in the production of that sort of capacity as we did during the Second World War, and then use the discount window of the regional Fed banks for sort of small businesses and startup firms, right? Sort of smaller projects. Then you might also extend essentially the, the maturity dates, the, the terms of eligible paper for discount. Say not three months, but maybe one year or two year paper so that it can still be relatively short term, but not a mere three months. And if you're talking in terms of three months, it looks like it's more about liquidity than anything else. If you extend the, the terms a little bit longer than that, then these could be sort of short-term loans. And if you allow for sort of rollover capacity as well, then you, know, you can actually, I think, have the regional feds doing a good job 
of providing adequate financing for innovative new startup firms, small family businesses and the like. So you've got a kind of a two tiered approach, you know, direct federal investment like during the Second World War for the big mass production projects and big infrastructure projects and the like and then do the spread fed for sort of smaller local businesses of the kind that were quite typical, of course, when the fed was first founded about 107 years ago. So, and you wouldn't need to change any laws for that. Can you keep rolling over the three month loans or that? One? There's no legal, there's no legal restriction on rolling over the loans. Um, you know, I think you might raise eyebrows if you kept doing that um, because, you know, after all, the law provides for the shorter term and you might look like you're evading it. So in the longer term, it would be good, I think, to change the legislation to make that sort of official. But in the meanwhile, it seems to me that it would be worth ex uh, experimenting with rollovers uh, until such time as we can actually change the, uh, the statutory terms on, um, on the short term lending. So, you know, as, as I see it, there are basically two benefits that are offered by some of the new payment technologies that are coming along, including the blockchain based payment technologies. And then there are some risks and dangers that can also come with that. And so it seems to me that the key that what we want to do is see if there's a way to kind of capture those two benefits while avoiding the, the risks, right? One of the benefits, of course, is just the real-time clearing and settlement of transactions, right? Just sort of instantaneous payment. The other, of course, is the privacy uh, benefits that cryptographic technologies can provide, right? Or can, uh, can sort of ensure. Um, so, uh, you know, those are fine, right? Um, the problems, of course, at least a couple of problems are, one is the same sort of cryptographic protections that might protect our privacy might also, of course, protect terrorists' privacy or money launderers' privacy or other criminals' privacy, and also might be manipulated right, by, you know, I don't know, I suppose bad faith action or actuated uh, government officials uh, or the like. And also this idea or the, the, the danger of sort of losing uh, domestic monetary autonomy, right? Losing the capacity to sort of determine our own domestic money supply. Um, it seems to me that there is a way to design the digital dollar whereby or pursuant to which you could sort of have the good and sort of uh, keep out the bad. The model I think that's worth uh, following here or learning from is the Swedish model. For some reason, the Scandinavians always seem to get it right on just about everything. And if we just actually just outsourced the development of all of our public policies to Sweden, we might be actually a better <laughs> model. <laughs> But, but as, as, as you know, uh, Sweden launched um, a sort of a trial um, of its new, its own new CBDC, uh, the e-Krona, about two years ago, late February of 2020. Um, and all the reports seem to be to the effect that it's working quite well. And essentially what they do is they program into the currency uh, a set of protocols that effectively replicate the way privacy worked for pre-digital currency. So basically, for you know, if your transaction exceeds a certain threshold amount, let's say it's the US amount that triggers the bank secrecy laws, $15,000, I think it is, uh, unless I'm out of date on that. You can correct me if I've got the wrong amount, but I think 15,000 might be the threshold amount. Um, that basically things have to be reported if you're talking about a transaction of more than 15,000 so that it can be tracked by authorities to make sure that you're not a terrorist or something. Um, but below that, uh, privacy is protected. And essentially they just sort of program in to the e-crona privacy up to the threshold amount and then a kind of minimal monitoring above that amount a kind it's kind of like a yellow flag goes up if there's a transaction amount that exceeds the threshold but even then it's not oh okay free for all now the authorities can look into everything it's that they can you know conduct some further inquiries to see whether there's good reason to be suspicious of this transaction or what have you um, but it seems to me that we ought to be able to do something like that 
uh, and we can write it into the law to assure that it's done that way. And also then to assure that any public official that acts contrary uh, to the law as thus formulated would be prosecutable, right? For you know, some serious crime. Um, then it seems to me it's worth doing. Um, but if we can't do that, then you know, I suppose I would be all for sticking with what we have, which is less than perfect. But I do but, think we have to keep our cash. <laughs> yeah, you know, just for, I agree. Yeah. Oh, I agree. Yeah, I wouldn't want to phase out cash. Yeah, yeah. partly because then there's always a threat of turning off the electricity, and then what? You know, you can't yeah. if you can't use your your, yeah. your phone or your card, you're stuck. Yeah. Yeah, um, especially given how speech- little we're. Uh, well, I was saying just especially given how little we're doing about the climate right now, I mean, I think we can assume that there will be more brownouts and there, blackouts. Yeah, there will be finish. there will be power outages. Yeah, um, and then you've also written on uh, digital currency for cities. Now, yes. I, what we're thinking about, and I don't know if this is possible, could a city issue its own digital uh, currency, not in dollars? that would actually create credit. I mean, it's. I did see somebody say that a digital currency needs to be backed by something that it could be backed by futures, like your future productivity, which is the same thing we're talking about with the uh, real bills that uh, you could have the city. Uh, I saw like LA has been doing free bus, but you know, the inner city bus is free. I don't know how long that's gonna go on, but you could have, your your city digital currency could be good for city services. Maybe the mm-hmm. bus, maybe, I don't know, parking meters. I mean, what do cities do? They used to do water and power and all that stuff, but I guess now that's that's privatized. But I just wonder, what could a city, we need to get more money into these local communities. Yeah, so I think that would be entirely workable, Ellen. I mean, a good example would be the Berkshires system, right, which seems to be succeeding quite handily at the moment and has been for some time. And as you know... Um, and the trouble, mutual- though, is that they're back dollar for dollar, which means they don't actually get new currency into the system. But right. uh, it seems to me there should be a way for a city, through its public bank, let's say, to issue currency to do a universal basic income that was, Mm -hmm. you know, that came from the city. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, there would have to be, of course, you know, sort of some way for the city to ensure that any sort of new quantities of money that it was issuing would, in fact, be, quote unquote, backed by or absorbable by some new kind of productivity that the issuance itself was making happen or was facilitating uh, the happening of. Now, one way to do this, um, it seems to me, is is a way that we've been trying to put together here in New York City, uh, which is, in essence, if you can find certain kinds of value-adding activity that are currently not remunerated but that do tend to enhance the wealth over time of the city itself, then what you could do is you could issue new payment forms to remunerate that kind of activity to encourage more of it, which then ultimately results in more economic growth in the city and hence a greater tax take over time. And that's where the source of liquidation occurs. Now, what so what are, what are you thinking of, like child care and elder care? and Precisely. I was going to say, what are some such activities? One would be elder care. Um, another would be, say, uh, after school tutoring. Like, let's say you've got older kids who are tutoring younger kids with their math homework after school or with other homework. Um, And this kind of educational assistance that's offered by older kids to younger kids results in a better educated local workforce over time and a more productive local economy over time and less crime and less social dysfunction because people are better educated um, and and more have more sort of socially affective relations with their peers uh, and the like. Um, In effect, what you'd be doing uh, is simply basically monetizing now those future gains that will be uh, those sort of wealth generating gains that will be realized later. Um, And if you can sort of show with reasonably plausible social science 
uh, that these are plausible expectations, that in fact, there will be a more educated workforce over time and hence a more productive and wealthier city over time and hence a greater public revenue base over time, um, then you could, you know, seems to me, justify doing this kind of thing. And you could do this easily with, with verification over uh, apps that are on smart devices like iPhones or the like, like for example, maybe the parents of the benefiting children verify that the older children did indeed, did indeed provide you know, two hours of tutoring on Wednesday or what have you. You get that so-called proof of work uh, as the Bitcoiners would call it. Uh, and then say that entitles um, the person who provided that work uh, to a payment into a digital wallet account by the city. Uh, or by the county or by whatever, whatever political unit decides to do this. Um, it seems to me things like that elder care, of course, is, is another one that could add value over time by lowering health care costs in the long term uh, that are faced by elderly folk, maybe because they've been better cared for in a preventive way. Um, and there are various other kinds of care work, as they call it, that are not presently remunerated, but that do add to social wealth over time, such that if we can encourage more of it by compensating some of it, um, there's no reason why we can't generate that kind of social wealth. And then the new money that is produced or disseminated in order to encourage the doing of it is simply going to be absorbed uh, by right that additional wealth that, that the or society- if it, if it were a, a different currency, like not in dollars, you could use it then for your own elder care. I know the Japanese did that with a community currency where in one city you could take care of somebody's grandparents and then in another city you could have somebody in that community, you know, that that uh, community currency community uh, yeah. would provide elder care for your, your parents yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't see why you couldn't do that. I mean, you could do it with dollars and just make the dollar a kind of community currency in this particular sense. But if you wanted to see to it that the new well, that the new money that was being generated is definitely spent locally and doesn't sort of go outside of the community that's disseminating it, then you could make it something like, you know, um, e Berkshires or, you know, kind of iPhone uh, Berkshires. And uh, there's no reason you can't do that. The real key, I think, is as you and I have been at pains to sort of emphasize for years now, is to make sure that there's a good tight link between the new money generation on the one hand and the production of more wealth that can absorb that newly generated money via the actual dissemination of the money uh, on the other hand. But you tie those two things together and what you're basically talking about is finance you know, totally plausible finance, where you're just making it possible. In effect, what you're doing, I think, is generating or fueling a kind of virtuous, self-fulfillingly prophetic circle, as distinguished from the vicious circle that is a bubble or a bust, right? Um, if you can sort of provide people with the wherewithal to be productive in ways that they currently don't have the wherewithal to do or be, you provide them with the, the wherewithal to be productive in that way, then they produce in that way. And so you've in effect made happen the very thing that you need to happen to make sure that that newly issued money isn't inflationary because of, its, because of being unproductive. And you also wrote a, an article called All Money is, <laughs> All money is Fiat Money, Most Money is Credit money, I thought that was interesting. And you say it's because it's backed by productivity, but it seems to me also uh, the dollar is backed by the full faith and credit of the United States, which means the full faith and credit of the people, like the people are willing to take it in return for yeah. their goods and services. Whereas yeah. virtually all cryptocurrencies are not, you know, people yeah. aren't willing to take it or even gold or silver. I mean, if I went to the grocery store, with a chunk of silver, my grocer wouldn't take it because he wouldn't know what it's worth. He wouldn't know exactly. how to give me change for it. Yeah, um, yeah. So it's not recognized as, so money is really just sort of that medium thing. Like seashells can be money if the if the 
community accepts accepts that <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Yeah, there's this misconception, I think, a lot of people, especially the kind of the, the, the gold enthusiasts and some of the Bitcoin enthusiasts as well now, they're kind of the digital gold bugs, I guess you could say. Um, there's this kind of misconception that basically so-called fiat money on the one hand and so-called precious metal money or specie money or commodity money or what have you uh, is somehow a polar opposite. As though these were sort of two completely different things that we made a big mistake when we went off of gold and went fiat. But what these people always overlook is that, you know, the word standard itself in the phrase gold standard, for example, ought to be a tip off that gold, the gold system was a fiat money system too. Fiat simply means decree. Uh, and it was legally decreed that gold would be the monetary base back during the gold standard days. But you know, that was itself an exercise of fiat. We made it legally the case. And that's what made it possible, of course, for Roosevelt to make it no longer legally the case when we went off the domestic gold standard in the 30s. And then for Nixon to make it no longer the case when we went off of gold as a global standard in the early 1970s. It's always something that we decide, quote unquote, by fiat as a society through our laws. And as you noted, right, yeah, the grocer doesn't have to take a chunk of silver for in payment for your groceries and probably won't. Uh, and there's no legal tender law that requires the grocer to accept that silver. Um, but there is, of course, if you read across a dollar bill when it says this note is good for all obligations, public and private, that's effectively telling everybody, yeah, you got to accept this in payment of obligations. It's the currency, right? And that's all done by fiat. It's done by social decision, right? I said... I saw I could, somebody was talking about a comedian who had done a, his own little study where he had offered people a, a little bar of silver or a candy bar, and everybody took the candy bar because they didn't know what the bar of sil silver was. So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I sometimes am fond of saying that, you know, people tend to think that gold and silver became monies because they were precious. But I think it's probably more accurate to say that they became precious because they were monies. Um, and you can sort of see this if you look at the price of silver in global markets back in the 19th century when silver was used for coinage. And then look at what happened to the market price of silver as soon as countries stopped using silver for coinage. Basically, the global price of silver plummeted. Uh, and that was a pretty good tip off, right? That it was quote unquote precious because it was monetary rather than being monetary because it was precious. And the reason that things like gold and silver came to be used as monies for a time isn't very difficult to understand. First of all, it was somewhat malleable so you could stamp the sovereign's image into it. And second of all, it didn't corrode in the way that iron does and it didn't deteriorate in the way that clay tablets might do. So, you know, gold does not rust, gold does not deteriorate and it's relatively malleable. So it made for a very convenient a monetary medium for a while um, until monetary needs came to exceed gold supplies. Um, but that's basically, I think, the story of the quote unquote precious of those metals. Sure, people like gold for jewelry and things like that, but you know, that's a kind of ornamental use. It's not an actual use use. <laughs> you can't eat it. Um, it's not inherent valuable. Um, and that's another thing that always kind of cracks me up when people say, well, gold has intrinsic value. And I say, what do you, what does that even mean? What is intrinsic value? Does it mean you can eat it and be nourished by it? I don't think so. Um, can't be nourished by gold. So where's the intrinsic value? I, I, I just don't get that one. So tether is supposedly the reserve currency for the cryptocurrencies. Like they're like, most cryptocurrencies, your grocer won't take them. But Tether yeah. was supposedly back one to one with yeah. dollars, which yeah. basically, so if you're backing it with dollars, you're, it's back to the, <laughs> the dollar system. But Tether yeah. now apparently wasn't backed one to one with dollars. It was backed by Evergrande for one thing. You know, it's backed by commercial paper or uh -huh. by debt, in other words. Uh -huh. And Evergrande yeah. is not paying, therefore, 
Black. Other is going down, and that <laughs> means the crypto. And uh, apparently, BlackRock was also heavily invested in Evergrande. That could. So I just wondered if you had any comments on that. Is that like is the whole system about to go down? It's yeah. It's that's it a great question. I think, Alan. I mean, I think there are reasons to worry that it could go down, and reasons to worry to 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 have some hope that that it won't. The bad news, of course, as you know, is that uh, China, in order to kind of continue to spur growth domestically, even when export revenues were beginning to decline during the pandemic and the like, basically adopted the American model of artificial stimulus, namely real estate bubbles. Uh, and so in effect, China has been a bit like the, what the US was like during the 1990s and the early 2000s. That's the bad news, right? That basically that's not a sustainable model for them any more than it was for us uh, 20 some odd years ago. Um, the one bit of quote unquote goodness is that of course the ruling party in China is not constrained uh, by the same kinds of constraints uh, that the American government is constrained by. And so there are certain kinds of rescue measures or floor provision measures that they are sort of legally capable of adopting that the US government would have found it more difficult to adopt either politically or legally or both. Um, and so I think China probably has more capacity to sort of stem the, or to kind of limit the damage, you might say, um, so that things might not go quite as terribly uh, as they did when we had our own real estate crash um, about almost 20 years ago. Um, but where, you know, whether they have the ultimate competence to do it right um, is, I suppose, still a question. But, you know, my own my own tendency is not to bet against China. I mean, they seem to be pretty good at figuring out what needs doing when it needs doing. Uh, and they don't have the same kinds of scruples, maybe that you or I might have against doing some things even that are kind of extreme when they have to. So uh, I don't I'm not I'm not as worried about a kind of China induced global collapse as some people might be. Uh, and I'm I am, I have to confess, you know, experiencing a certain amount of uh, enjoyable laughter um, uh, at watching Tether come untethered um, and watching all of the cryptopians who have been sort of singing the utopian praises of some of these currencies, you know, scramble now as they realize, no, nope, there was no value proposition there at all. <laughs> I know your your articles are on Forbes, which is great. So I'll re refer people to Forbes magazine. But where else can they find your work, or where would you refer people? Thanks, thanks so much for that, Ellen. Yeah, if they just Google my name on the one hand with two T's, Hockett and Forbes, or if they Google my name and SSRN, which stands for Social Science Research Network. Pretty much everything I write is on SSRN or on Forbes, or they could just Google the name Robert Hockett. It turns out that there aren't many Robert Hockets out there, um, so they're likely to find anything that I've written that way as well. All right, Great. thanks, Bob. It's been super talking to you. Wonderful talking to you again. <laughs> okay. Bye. I've been speaking with Bob Hockett. A professor at Cornell Law School. His work can be found at Forbes magazine, among many other sources. Well, that's it for this edition of It's Our Money with Ellen Brown. Our thanks to our guests, our sponsor, Public Banking Associates, and to you for listening. Be sure to check out Ellen's latest writings on the economy and the changing world of money by visiting ellenbrown.com. And for more information on public banking, visit publicbankinginstitute.org. For information on how local and state government leaders can obtain professional insight and counsel about public banks from key national experts, visit publicbankingassociates.com. I'm Walt McCree. See you next time on It's Our Money with Ellen Brown. Money!